Hannah McDonald with the Alliance Francaise de Chicago, and today I will be reading part two, chapter eight of Bonjour Tristesse by Françoise Segon. The next day I awoke feeling perfectly fine, barely tired, just with the back of my neck aching slightly as a result of my excesses. As it was every morning, my bed was bathed in sunlight. I pushed back my sheets, took off my pajama top, and turned my bare back to the sun. With my cheek resting on my folded arm, I could see close up the coarse texture of the linen sheet and beyond that on the tiled floor, the vacillations of a fly. The sun was warm and gentle. It seemed to make my bones expand beneath my skin and to make special care to bestow its warmth upon me. I decided to spend the whole morning like that, not budging. The previous evening was gradually becoming clearer in my memory. I remember having told Anne that Cyril was my lover, and I laughed to think that when you're drunk, you say things that are true and no one believes you. I also remembered Madame Webb and my altercation with her. I was familiar with that type of woman. In those circles and at her age, they were often odious because they had nothing to occupy themselves with, yet they still desired to live life to the full. Anne's serenity had led me to view Madame Webb as being even more idiotic and annoying than usual. It was only to be expected. I failed to see who among my father's female friends could stand comparison with Anne for long. In order to spend a pleasant evening with these people, you had to either be a little drunk and enjoy arguing with them, or to be in an intimate relationship with one or other of the spouses. For my father, it was simpler. He and Charles Webb both loved the thrill of the chase. Guess who I'm going to wine and dine and then bed tonight? The little Mars girl, the one who was in Sorrel's film. I was going into Dupuy's place when... My father would laugh and slap him on the shoulder. Lucky man, she's almost as lovely looking as Elise. Schoolboy talk, but what I liked about it was both men's enthusiasm and ardor. And during interminable parties or on the terrace of cafes, I even liked Lombard's melancholy avowals. She was the only one I ever loved, Raymond. You remember that spring before she left me? It's crazy, a man's life ruined for the sake of one woman. There was something inappropriate and demeaning about all of this, but there was a warmth, too, in two men exchanging confidences over a drink. Anne's friends probably never talked about themselves. Doubtless, they did not indulge in such escapades. Or even if they did talk about such things, it would most likely be with a shame-faced laugh. I was ready to share with Anne the condescending attitude she would adopt toward our acquaintances. It was not unkind, and it was contagious. Yet I could see myself at 30 being more like our friends than like her and finding her silence, her aloofness, and her reserve suffocating. Indeed, I could imagine in 15 years time being somewhat blasé. I pictured myself leaning across to an attractive man just as world weary as I was to say, my first lover was called Cyril. I was not quite 18. The sun was hot over the sea. I took pleasure in visualizing the man's face. He would have the same little wrinkles as my father. There was a knock at the door. I hastily got into my pajama top and called, Come in. It was Anne, carefully balancing a cup. I thought you might be in need of some coffee. You're not feeling too bad, I hope. I'm feeling fine, I said. I was a little bit tipsy last night, you know. You're the same every time we take you anywhere. She began to laugh. But I must say I found you entertaining. It was a long evening. I was no longer noticing the sun, or, nor even paying attention to the taste of the coffee. Whenever I talked to Anne, I was totally absorbed. I was no longer observing myself. And yet she was the one who was always calling me into question and forcing me to judge myself. It was because of her that I experienced intense moments of difficulty. Cecile, do you enjoy being with those sorts of people, the Webbs and the Dupuis? I find the way that they behave mostly quite tedious, but they can be very funny. She too was watching the comings and goings of the fly on the floor. I thought there must be something wrong with the fly. Anne had very long, heavy eyelids, so it was easy for her to look condescending. Don't you ever realize how monotonous their conversation is and, how can I put it, how lumbering it is? All of these stories of contracts, girls, parties, do they never bore you? You know, I said, I spent 10 years in a convent, so it still fascinates me that these people have no morals. I did not dare add that it also appealed to me. Even after two years, she said, yet it's not... Yet, it's got nothing to do with being rational or moral. It's a question of one's sensitivity and having a sixth sense. I suppose I didn't have one. I distinctly felt that I was lacking something in that department. Anne, I asked abruptly, do you think I'm intelligent? She began to laugh, astonished at the directness of my question. But of course I do. Why do you ask? 
Even if I were an idiot, you would give me the same answer, I sighed. You often give me the impression of being one step ahead of me. It's just a question of age, she said. It would be highly regrettable if I were not a little more self-assured than you. You would be able to influence me, she laughed out loud. I was vexed. That wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. It would be a catastrophe, she said. She suddenly dropped her bantering tone and looked me straight in the eye. Feeling awkward, I shifted slightly. Even today, I cannot get used to this mania people have for staring at you when they are talking to you or for coming up close to you to make sure you are listening. Of course, it's a miscalculation on their part because when it happens, my only thought is of retreat and escape. I say, yes, yes, while doing everything I can to get away and flee to the other end of the room. I become furious at their insistence, their lack of discretion, their claims of my exclusive attention, and fortunately did not feel obligated to corner me in this way. She confined herself to looking at me steadily in the eye so that it became hard for me to sustain that detached, lighthearted note that I so much favored. Do you know how many, do you know how men of Webb's type finish up? I thought to myself, and of my father's type. In the gutter, I said brightly. The time comes when they are no longer attractive or on form, as the saying goes. They can't drink anymore, and they are still thinking about women. The only thing is, they now have to pay for them and accept a host of little compromises to escape their loneliness. They are sad dupes. That's when they ought to become sentimental and demanding. I've seen a lot of them turn into wrecks in that way. Poor Webb, I said. I was at a loss. In truth, that was how my father risked ending up. At least it would have been the end in store for him if Anne had not taken charge. You hadn't thought of that, said Anne with a little smile of commiseration. You don't think much about your, the future, do you? That's youth's privilege. Oh, please, I said. Don't cast my age up at me like that. I use that card as little as possible. I don't think being young gives me a right to every privilege or excuse. I don't attach any importance to it. What do you attach importance to? To being left alone? To being independent? I was afraid of conversations like this, especially when they were with Anne. I don't attach importance to anything, I said. I don't do a lot of thinking, you know. I find you rather irritating, you and your father. You don't ever think about anything. You're not good at much. You don't know. Does that make you pleased with yourselves? I'm not pleased with myself. I don't like myself. I don't set out to like myself. There are times when you force me to make my life complicated. I almost resent you for it. She began to hum to herself pensively. I recognized the tune, but I couldn't remember what it was. What is that song, Anne? It's annoying me. You don't know, or I don't know. She smiled again, seeming a little discouraged. Stay in bed and rest yourself. I am going to pursue my research into the family's intellect elsewhere. Of course, I thought it's easy for my father. From where I was, I could hear him saying, I don't think about anything much because I love you, Anne. For all her intelligence, that reason would likely to appear valid to her. I had a good long stretch and dived back into my pillow. I did reflect on a lot of things in spite of what I had said to Anne. Really, she was dramatizing the situation. In 25 years' time, my father would be a lovable sexagenarian with white hair and a fondness for whiskey and highly colored reminiscences. We would go out together. I would be the one to recount my escapades to him, and he would be the one giving me advice. It struck me that I was excluding Anne from this future of ours. I was unable to find a place for her in it. I just couldn't picture it. Our chaotic flat could sometimes be desolate, but at other times it was full of flowers and abuzz with activity and unfamiliar accents. It was frequently colored up with luggage. I just could not imagine it pervaded by the order, silence, and harmony which Anne brought with her wherever she went, as if she were bringing the most precious of assets. I was terrified that I would die of boredom. I probably feared her influence less since loving Cyril in a real and physical sense. That had liberated me from many of my terrors. But more than anything, I feared boredom and repose. To be inwardly reposeful, my father and I needed to be outwardly in ferment. And that was something Anne would never be able to acknowledge. That's all for now. Thank you.